Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Brendan, thanking the uh, Institute of International and European Affairs, thanking uh, McCann Fitzgerald uh, for the kind invitation to, to speak, um, to have this opportunity to participate in this excellent series. Uh, and I certainly know that at times like this, times are tough. Um, and for organisations like the Institute, which operate on a primarily voluntary basis with huge support from members, um, from those of you who are here, um, equally the corporate sponsorship and the support, uh, the financial support um, for organisations like the IIEA is absolutely invaluable. So I just want to acknowledge that um, as a member and as um, a supporter of the work of the Institute, um, it is deeply appreciated. Um, I would like to thank you, John, for your introduction. Um, I found uh, that article uh, penned by, I'm not sure whom, but I suspect I may have an idea, in the Farmer's Journal. Um, it, sounded like, it sounded like my maybe my, my headier days when I was in Young for the Gale, but as you know, the t wheels of change uh, grind one down and maybe I'm a little bit more moderate in my, in my thinking and my, in my views these days. Um, but um, but it, is, um, it is really interesting, I think, to look back and to reflect on that period um, when we joined the European uh, communities as we approached that point and the transformation that has happened in this country um, since then. And uh, I'm very proud to be associated um, with the Irish presidency at this point. Um, as you know, we reached the, the midway point of our presidency just, uh, just a week ago. Um, and this invitation to address you here really gives me a good opportunity um, to review some of the progress that we have made to date um, in reaching the objectives which we set out for ourselves um, at the beginning of our presidency and our presidency programme um, and also, I suppose, to, to look at, at, at the remaining time and um, the perhaps acceleration of work that needs to happen in certain areas uh, and on certain priorities. I think um, it also it, it gives us an opportunity to look at the challenges that remain uh, to see how we can be more focused, more targeted um, and ultimately contribute to delivering on the core objectives of our presidency, which are, of course, as I'm sure you're aware by now, promoting stability, growth and job creation. That has been the, the driving focus, if you like, of our presidency and uh, will continue to be until uh, the end of June. Um, without, I mean, it's always difficult to praise oneself for one's own administration, but, um, but I think um, I, I do have to say that we are, as a government, very satisfied with the progress um, that we have made to date. Um, but, of course, we, we are aware that we have a lot of work yet to do. Um, there are many challenges that remain, and a lot of our big uh, ticket items will have to be addressed in the, co in the concluding part of our presidency. Um, so, so the work certainly goes on. We remain firmly committed uh, to ensuring that this our seventh presidency, leaves a positive, a strong and lasting legacy for Ireland, but also for the whole of the European Union. And that's a pretty big task uh, and one that, that certainly uh, we all feel on our shoulders at this point. Since entering office, the government, uh, as you know, has worked intensively to ensure that firstly, we succeeded in re-engaging um, on the European stage, re-engaging with the institutions, with our European partners, and you know, firmly uh, letting our partners know that, that Ireland is very much in business and very much back in town. But we have also been working intensively on our presidency preparations so that we could hit the ground running on the 1st of January when we took over the presidency. Um, and just to give you an idea of you know, the, the amount and the intensity of preparations, when I was appointed European Affairs Minister in March uh, 2011, pretty much immediately I took over um, a group coordinating the policy agenda for our presidency, um, which brings together all government departments um, and uh, helped us ultimately to, to build and develop our presidency programme. So um, almost two years of work uh, from our point of view, and indeed some of that work had even begun at official level before we came into government. So it's a pretty labour-intensive task um, and one that, that has taken up a lot of time. Um, I think it's fair to say that the pace and the volume of work uh, required 
a strong investment of time, um, of resources, uh, and in terms of preparation by ministers, particularly who are leading um, councils, and also by our, our very, very dedicated a group of civil servants who are chairing council working groups and I can tell you that that is a pretty heavy agenda. Um, so over the past year in particular we placed a strong emphasis on building those close contacts um, with the key institutions as I mentioned, particularly the European Parliament who as you know have a, have a much enhanced role um, since we agreed uh, and put in place the Lisbon Treaty. Um, so uh, that those contacts and that preparatory work, that groundwork, has been hugely important in preparing uh, us um, in terms of our capacity to deliver on our goals. So this means that we were able to engage in negotiations with the Parliament and indeed with other institutions from the very start of the presidency. We had built the relationships. They, you know, the chairs of the committees, the rapporteurs, the key people knew our ministers, knew what our presidency was about, were familiar with our priorities and knew what we wanted to achieve in, in that six months. And so it meant that we could start with excellent working relations and hopefully start as, as we mean to go on in terms of achieving our objectives. Um, before setting out the progress on our key objectives so far, um, I just would like to stress for a moment the, the importance of this presidency for Ireland. Um, the objectives of the presidency programme um, and the, the programme for government dovetail. They, they really do meld very, very well together, probably better than any previous presidency. Um, because, as I said, making uh, progress on delivering stability, growth and jobs is absolutely critical for our own long-term national interest, but also for the overall interest of the European Union. So, you know, there, there is very little distinction at the moment between Ireland's national interest and the European agenda. And so I think um, for us, it's been a very, a very pleasant task in building um, priorities for the presidency around what are very, very obvious priorities for us um, here in, on the domestic scene. The government um, is also working to ensure that the results of the presidency and the way in which we manage um, the presidency during our term in office will contribute to rebuilding our reputation internationally as a competent and an effective international actor. And that's very important for a country that had huge reputational damage inflicted upon it um, in recent <laughs> years, that had somewhat become semi-engaged or disengaged um, on the European stage and indeed um, on the wider international stage. Um, so we are really using um, the, the, the presidency as an opportunity to showcase Ireland what we can do, what we can achieve, how we can manage the agenda and of course also looking to the future beyond the end of June, how we can use these contacts and these very crucial relationships um, in the longer term to maintain a strong engagement with EU fairs and to ensure that the Irish voice is heard at the table in an effective way in all fora, in all institutions, with all of our European partners um, in the medium and long term as well. Ireland obviously sees its, its future at the, the very heart of a strengthened EU and so our presidency gives us the opportunity to re-establish re ourselves as a constructive and an active EU participant, and that's very important to, to us. Since the presidency started, Ireland has held 25 formal and informal council meetings chaired by government ministers. There have been two European councils so far, where we have, of course, been represented by the Taoiseach, uh, including uh, the most critical meeting um, of EU leaders which took place in early February on uh, concluding the EU's future budget for the next seven years, the so-called MFF, the Multiannual Financial Framework. Irish officials have chaired more than a thousand working party meetings since January, believe it or not, um, all of which have been aimed at driving um, the EU work agenda forward with a very, very strong emphasis on proposals which support growth and jobs. The results achieved by the Presidency to date are based uh, on hard work 
on patience and on carefully negotiated compromises, which is the essence of what the EU is all about. That's how the EU moves, moves forward, and it has been the model, if you like, um, since its very inception. As presidency, we're working to ensure that all voices are heard, um, from the programme of citizens' dialogues, which we are running, and I, um, I participated in one in Athlone last night, to our ministers listening to the views and concerns of members of the European Parliament and, of course, of our colleagues, ministers from other member states. Um, I'll give you an illustrative list of key decisions which have been reached under the Irish presidency during the first three months in office. They include the famous budget, the MFF, which has been agreed now by heads of state and government. I'll talk about the parliament in a few minutes. Um, they include the youth guarantee, uh, economic governance measures, banking union legislation, the common agricultural policy uh, reform package, and dozens of other pieces of important legislation. We are determined to drive growth and jobs in Europe, but the foundations on which economic recovery are built have to be stable, and that's why stability is a big focus for us. So as presidency, we're working hard to take fundamental and long-term decisions that will restore confidence in public finances in member states and indeed in the European banking sector. So in February, the Irish presidency helped to broker a really crucial uh, agreement with the European Parliament, which had been deadlocked. Um, this is the two-pack two of economic governance legislation, which complements, of course, the six-pack, which was agreed um, over a year ago. Um, and that is designed to improve budgetary and economic coordination amongst Euro area members. So it's a really key piece of uh, the Euro area's um, economic architecture and will further contribute to fin financial and economic stability. And I think if we've learned any lesson during the Euro crisis, it is that what you know, decisions that are taken in Dublin or Athens or Berlin or Paris all impact on each other. Uh, every member state's um, fi public finances um, have a direct impact <coughs> on, on those of other, other member states. And the economic decisions that we take, the budgetary policy decisions that we take matter a great deal uh, within the, the euro currency uh, area. And, uh, and therefore, we've had to put in place much better over oversight and much better scrutiny. And the two-pack is another, another step in that road. During um, the first half of the presidency, of course, we also implemented the European semester, uh, which is based on a roadmap of actions which we developed in late 2012, which were adopted by the General Affairs Council in December and which now form the basis for the semester process um, for the first <coughs> half of, of 2013. Um, this process, and some of you may not be so familiar with it, um, it aims to promote stronger economic and fiscal coordination and to ensure that member states undertake the necessary reforms to restore fiscal health, to strengthen budgetary discipline, and to deliver smart and sustainable jobs and growth within the Europe 2020 framework. So it's to pull all of those elements together. And following discussions at the March European Council, we, conclude, we concluded the first part of the process. Member states are now preparing their national reform uh, and jobs plans uh, with a view to with with a, a review um, which will inform uh, clear country-specific recommendations, which will be agreed at the final European Council of our pre presidency, which will take place in June. So that will be the culmination of the process when the country-specific recommendations are adopted. And just a note on that, because I think this is a really important um, framework. It's in its third year of existence, and it's really, you know, it's finding its feet. It's a new process, but a very, very important one, where there is a little bit of peer review, if you like, of, of each other. Um, but one thing that concerned me a little bit when we were coming into the role of presidency was that our national parliaments were not so engaged in this process. And, you know, obviously governments take this seriously, but maybe national parliamentarians weren't engaging as fully as they might. So uh, I took the initiative with Commissioner Sefcovic, who's responsible for in interinstitutional relations, to write to the to the speakers, the Kian Korla, if you like, of all of the parliaments around Europe, asking them and calling on them to engage fully in the process and to engage in debating in their chambers 
uh, the country specific recommendations so that governments have a clear idea of uh, what their parliaments expect uh, when it comes to the June European Council. It's not really, I suppose, something we can instruct or direct parliaments to do, but it's something that I think is really, really important. Members of parliament, elected representatives, have to take responsibility uh, for these crucial decisions. Um, and as we know in the past, it's often been the case that national politicians blame Europe for a lot of things, but don't necessarily accept responsibility. So we're just trying to encourage a little bit more of a sense of responsibility and ownership of this process, as well as holding governments to account for what they agree agree at the June Council. So hopefully that will be a little initiative that will, um, will um, generate uh, some activity in national parliaments right across the 27 member states. Um, making progress on restoring the health of the banking sector is, I think comes as no surprise, is uh, another key challenge and a key priority. The proposals that make up the EU's banking union package are a major priority for Ireland's presidency and they are designed to prevent a recurrence of the problems that have blighted the banking sector um, in, a, in a number of me member states, including our own in recent years. So we're very, very pleased to have reached uh, a very important agreement uh, in recent weeks with uh, the European Parliament on the Capital Requirements Directive, which will ensure that European banks hold enough uh, good quality capital to withstand possible economic and uh, financial shocks. Uh, the directive will also enforce, and I think this is of major interest to citizens, greater transparency um, and discourage excessive risk ta taking, including through the restrictions on uh, bankers' pay which are introduced. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say that finance ministers signalled their political uh, agreement to this deal at the beginning of March, so it's well on the way to conclusion, and that is a really crucial deal and one that is not without controversy, as I'm sure you're well aware. Um, work is also progressing on uh, the single supervisory mechanism, which of course is the core element of the banking union um, proposals, and it is a vital step in breaking the link between banks and sovereigns. It's the first step, if you like, um, and it paves the way for other crucial decisions that must be taken at EU level. Um, with these proposals coming over the line, we will now focus our efforts during the remainder of the presidency on making progress on the bank resolution and recovery directive and other, other legislation in the financial services sector. So there is um, a lot of work to be done, but um, we're, we are on target in terms of uh, the progress made to date. The EU uh, needs to ensure that it provides the greatest support possible to foster economic recovery across <coughs> Europe, uh, including by reducing regional disparities and, of course, tackling unemployment black spots, of which, unfortunately, there are many. So the agreement reached um, at the February European Council on the multi-annual financial framework, the EU's budget for 2014 to 2020, which amounts to nearly €1 trillion Euro of funding for all of the key policy uh, areas. Um, this is a key element in contributing to Europe's economic recovery and, of course, to future growth and, indeed, to social cohesion. And we know all about it because we've benefited from it for many, many years in this country. Um, the supports in the budget uh, in areas such as cohesion, um, regional funding, can make a real and positive uh, difference to economic recovery and job creation in communities in every single member state. And we are satisfied um, that the budget is, is very well focused on this occasion. Um, tackling youth unemployment is a, is a key focus of the budget. Boosting key growth areas um, such as research and innovation. Uh, ma maintaining solidarity, of course, with less developed member states. Uh, and with regions which have been particularly severely affected by the economic crisis. These are all important priorities of the budget, and I think the balance that we have struck is quite good. But, of course, the next step is um, securing the assent of the European Parliament um, to the budget, which um, will remain one of the main challenges facing our presidency during the second half um, of our term in office. The Taoiseach has met with the President of the European Parliament and the President of the Commission on a number of occasions in recent months to try to move the process forward. Um, and I've obviously been, um, as, as a representative of the Presidency um, in, in 
the European Parliament. I have been meeting regularly with the MEPs there and in fact the Tonish and I will travel to, to Brussels tomorrow for our first official trilogue, trilogue uh, on, uh, on the MFF. So um, this work is intensifying and uh, we're very hopeful and confident that uh, we will be able to secure agreement uh, on the MFF by June. Um, and for us, that's hugely important uh, for, for some very obvious reasons. There are 70 pieces of legislation um, that have to be enacted in order for the budget to come into effect on the 1st of January 2014. Um, and we have made huge strides on most of those elements, um, most of those pieces of legislation. But of course, they cannot be concluded until the budget is in place. So it's very, very important that we do stick to our target and that we do complete it by, um, by uh, June. Um, and as I said, securing agreement on the budgetary process is crucial to a lot of programmes. And just some examples, obviously the Common Agricultural Policy, that's the one of, of most keen interest to us in Ireland because 85% of our seats come from the cap. Um, also the fisheries reform proposal cannot come into, into being until, until the budget is in place. Erasmus for all, and I'm pleased to say that Erasmus, um, which is something that's familiar to all of us in this country, many of us, many of our peers, our children, our cousins have benefited from the Erasmus programme. It's, the, it's one of the few strands of funding that has actually increased in this budget. Um, that's dependent on agreement with the Parliament, as is Horizon 2020 and all of the investment and research programmes. Um, so they all have a, a major potential to impact positively um, on, the, on the whole area of economic growth and, and indeed social development within the Union. So it's a big, big priority for us and one that we've made good progress on, but we now have to bring it to fruition by the end of the presidency. And crucially, the decision which was re reached in February um, includes a €6 billion Euro, uh, funding allocation for a new youth employment initiative. Um, so we're delighted to steer through political agreement in February, late February, on the new Youth Guarantee. Um, so this, I think, will stand as one of the achievements of our presidency, given the very, very high rate of youth unemployment at the moment. The guarantee, very briefly, it aims to ensure that young people under 25 who are out of work um, will receive an offer either of employment, continuing edu education, an apprenticeship, or a traineeship. Um, that's a big and ambitious goal but uh, I think that the political will is there to do it and there is now some dedicated funding also to support that. If it's successfully implemented, the Youth Guarantee can contribute to, to increasing an, uh, uh, employment, um, hopefully to reducing early school leaving and also to ensure that jobless young people avoid poverty traps and social, uh, social exclusion. So it's, it's a very important priority for us. Um, we will also continue to work very, very hard in the second half of our presidency on measures that will reduce youth unemployment, uh, including through greater access to education and training uh, under programmes like Erasmus for All, which I mentioned. Um, the presidency is also working on a, on a broad range of measures um, which are aimed at, at providing much stronger support to foster growth and research um, and innovation. Um, particularly where we have the potential for the EU to become a global leader. So we have to invest wisely and smartly. We all know that resources are limited, um, but we are trying to, to be smart in how we go about it. So we will be applying our own national expertise, if you like, our, our experience of using uh, research and innovation uh, funding to underpin um, the growth that we can push forward through the Horizon 2020 programme, um, and we consider that to, to provide the potential to really um, drive a world-class research and innovation uh, hub in Europe. Um, and that, of course, will contribute to boosting growth and boosting the knowledge economy. Um, we're all aware that researchers across Europe um, must be able to access funding uh, with a minimum of red tape. Um, likewise, SMEs which have great potential to generate growth and jobs, must also benefit from funding for research and innovation. So that's why we're focusing um, in our presidency on programmes such as the Competitiveness for SMEs programme, better known as COSME, uh, which is all about enabling 
uh, SMEs to access funding and to be able to benefit from the sort of programmes that are available at EU level. We're also, as you know, uh, focusing very much um, on the opportunities for growth and jobs that arise from completing the single market. Um, a number of the measures under Single Market Act 1 have still um, yet to be com completed. Um, we were very pleased and honoured to sign in February the Unified Patent Court Agreement, which um, will provide businesses, and in particular, again, Europe's small and medium-sized enterprises, with a central one-stop shop um, for registering and for protect protecting patents. It is long overdue, and I think it's a very significant achievement, although we can't claim credit for it entirely. Um, I think the Cyprus presidency and presidencies before us uh, put a huge effort into that, but it's a really important um, uh, decision. Further advances in this area, I think, will deliver multiple benefits, which will spur business um, growth and job creation and is very much at the heart and core of our agenda. Likewise, the digital single market, we've made good progress to date on the complex data protection issue. Um, and we're pretty satisfied with the progress that has been made in that area so far. We're also working very hard on the e-signatures, e-identification uh, agenda. This is hugely important for con consumer confidence, for business confidence in transacting online. Um, it's not easy, it's very complex, but uh, we have invested um, a huge amount of time at official level in, in bringing this, um, this agenda forward. Um, while we are working on strengthening the single market, um, we are also looking outside of the EU. We know that over the years to come, 90% um, of the growth that will take place globally will not occur in the EU. So we have to exploit the opportunities that exist in the whole area of e external trade. Um, we are putting a particular emphasis on the EU-US trade, trade agreement. Um, so we were very pleased with the progress that's been made to date. You'll be aware of President Obama's commitment, the fact that the US administration has now begun preparing its negotiating position for the EU-US um, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Likewise, um, our um, officials have begun working on preparing uh, and developing the Commission proposal, um, which will form the basis of the EU's negotiating position. And we hope that we will be on target to launch those negotiations by June. That's an ambitious target, one that I think a lot of people might have considered unrealistic at the start of our presidency, but it is looking increasingly realistic as the days go on. We've made a lot of progress already. Um, so we're very positive about that. I'm conscious, Ch Chairman, that I'm, I'm, I'm going on and I, I want to leave some time for, um, for um, questions and answers. But just a few other points on the trade agenda. Um, negotiations with Japan uh, also started in March and the EU is currently ne negotiating on trade issues um, with Canada, Singapore, India, China, Thailand and ASEAN. So there is a lot happening in the external trade agenda. In the area of agriculture policy, the Irish presidency has successfully uh, concluded negotiations on a general approach on the cap. Um, and the Council of Agriculture Ministers, chaired by Ireland, agreed its position on the Commission's reform proposals um, just a, a few weeks ago. So our objective is to secure an interinstitutional agreement by the end of June. And that agreement will deal, of course, with a range of complex issues, including um, sensitive ones um, in relation to direct payments, um, which, uh, again, I think most of you will be familiar with. Um, and we're also working, working um, intensively on the uh, reform proposals for the fisheries policy. So um, a lot of progress has been made there, and we're hoping to conclude most of that by the end of June. In other policy areas, such as transport, we've made good progress. Um, the informal ministerial meetings on environment and energy will be hosted the week after next in Dublin Castle by Ministers Hogan and Rabbit. And they will contribute to the presidency's ambitious agenda in these areas. And of course, will also feed into the European Council, which is going to focus on energy in May. Um, on the enlargement front, which is the, um, the area that I have been leading on for, for the presidency, um, we're working to ensure that we can make progress on the accession process in a range of countries. Um, we 
hope and believe that we will open a chapter with Turkey, um, the first in almost three years before the presidency concludes. We're also looking uh, forward to making similar progress with um, Montenegro's acce accession. Um, obviously, with the ratification of Croatia's accession treaty by Slovenia, the final member state to do so at the beginning of the month, Croatia, I'm pleased to say, will join on the 1st of July, and the presidency has been fully supportive of Croatia's accession to the EU, and we are particularly pleased that the ratification of the treaty um, was successfully completed during our term. Um, the issues that I have outlined, there are many more, and I could talk about enlargement uh, all day, um, but um, I, I would like to just say that this is a, a very, believe it or not, concise overview of a very, very vast agenda that we're working on. Um, and I would simply like to say that you know, this is a hugely important period for, for Ireland, for the government, for the country in terms of re-establishing ourselves. Um, and we have a fantastic group of people working across all government departments, as I said, already chairing a thousand meetings at official level. Um, and we'll continue with that level of intensive work until the end of our presidency. So I would like to express my gratitude for the fantastic uh, support that we have received from our civil servants and from our officials in Brussels particularly. Um, we have a lot which remains to be implemented, a lot of work yet to do, as you can see. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we are on track um, and we will continue to remain uh, ambitious and optimistic um, as we work with our partners to conclude and fulfil all of our presidency objectives by the end of June. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to thank you all for attending today and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you.